Hello, this is Brett Allred, and in this course we're going to be doing an introduction to computer science. So, to begin, I want to talk a little bit about the basics of a computer. A computer consists of two major components, the hardware and the software. Hardware, you can think of anything that's physical that you can touch. So, that could be a keyboard, it could be a monitor or a mouse, or the actual physical components inside of the computer, like the processor or the RAM, uh, the hard disk drive, anything that's physical about a computer, we consider that hardware. The second major component of a computer is the software. This is all of the digital signal that exists. It's all of the soft component that you can't really touch, you can't see. It's the code. It's the software that runs the computer. And so when we think of computers at the highest level, we think in hardware and we think in software. So when we jump down into hardware, the model that we use today is called the von Neumann architecture. And it consists of really three main components. And so the first thing are input devices. So this is what gives input into the computer. So a, a keyboard, you can type the keys and enter in characters and that inputs into the computer. A mouse is also an input device that as you move it around, it gives input to the computer where to move the cursor, whether to go up or to go left or to go right. That's giving input to the computer. A more modern example of input would be a smartphone that has a touch display. You can uh, type in um, using like a digital keyboard into the computer or you can use gestures with your finger, but that's all with um, the phone and the touch gestures that have come out in the last few years. So there's other input devices, but the most important thing is to remember that there's a big category of hardware that we consider input devices. That input then goes into the computer, which the computer consists of two major components. One is the central processing unit. You can think of that as the brains of the computer that does all of the calculations. It's doing the addition and the multiplication and it's moving things around in memory. It's really orchestrating everything that happens in the computer. And then there's memory. And that's uh, just internal storage in the computer so it can remember what it's doing. And we'll get into that a little bit more in future lessons, but uh, memory is just storage that exists in the computer for the, the central processing unit or the CPU to work with. Then once it's done doing its computation and its calculation, it needs to take that data and send it to an output. So it could output it to a monitor, put it to your screen, you could send it to a printer, or you could send it to a, a hard disk drive to save for more long-term storage. And so this system of inputs, uh, computation, and outputs is really the, basic, the basis of all uh, computers and computer science and how it works. And so there was a, a mentor that I had that he told me this little phrase that is IO is everything and everything is IO. And IO stands for inputs and outputs. And really in computers, IO is everything. And everything that we're doing is either an input, some type of computation, or an output. So let me give you an example here. If I open up a text editor like Atom, I have an input device, which is my keyboard that I type in hello world. That's going into the computer. It's getting converted into ones and zeros. And then it's getting outputted to this screen. And so that's an example of input going into the computer for processing and then output to a screen. Now if I was to click file and print, I could print this to a printer and that would be going to an output device. Or maybe I could save this and email it to somebody and it would go out of my computer through a network card onto the internet and it would go out to them. So study a little bit more on your own time with the von Neumann architecture. You can learn about this idea a little bit more of inputs, computation, and outputs. But really this is everything that we're having to work with. And that's a good example of what's happening with the hardware. Now software gets a little bit more interesting. Uh, there's lots of kinds of software. So I built this little tree to represent different types of software that exist. So off this left branch, we see system software. 
And the most basic um, piece of software is the operating system. So you're probably familiar with Windows as an operating system or maybe Mac OS X or potentially Linux as the three major operating systems that exist. Now there's, there's other operating systems, but those are the main three. Next, there's system support software. So if you're on a Mac, you can think of Finder, which you can open up and browse the files and it helps you work with your system. In Windows, there's Windows Explorer, which will help you do the same thing, but just on Windows. Then we have system development software, which actually allows us to develop software for the system. So you can think of like the C programming language with you have the language and you have the compiler and you have the linker and the loader, everything that goes in um, to help you create software. Uh, Java is another example of system development software. They have uh, different programming languages. You have the Java programming language and then the Java virtual machine. All of this and a bunch of different tooling to help you develop um, system software or to develop software in general. Moving off the right branch we have application software which you can really break those into two sections maybe more but for our purpose there's general purpose software which is software that does a lot of different things. It's, it's used for a general purpose. So Microsoft Word might be an example uh, on Mac. Uh, um, I think they call it Keynote. Well they have Keynote uh, numbers and pages. Pages is the equivalent to Word where you can use it for a lot of different things. You could write a book in it. Uh, you could create a presentation in it. Uh, it's really just it can be used for any function. You could um, it's almost limitless what you could do. Another example is a database. Uh, database is general purpose because there's lots of different ways that you can use a database um, for whatever your need is. Then you have application software. This is more specific to a function. So I think of QuickBooks as an example. If you don't know what QuickBooks is, um, it's used for accounting. And so it's very specific for accountants to go in, manage their ledger, manage their books, figure out all of the uh, do the different reports for accounting, but it's very focused on accounting. So that's that's specific, um, a specific application. So when we are writing software, it's interesting to think of these things because you have an operating system to work with, you have system support software, you have system development software, there's general purpose software, application software, all of these things that give you ideas on what you can do for your application, and you can leverage what's already been created to help you build up uh, your application. So uh, one last concept before we get into writing our own software. I want to talk a little bit about the process of writing software. So we have a programmer that gets a text editor and in some of the previous lessons we've been using the Atom text editor and he'll type in all of the different codes uh, into the text editor and then he'll use a compiler to take that, and we're going to use the C programming language with a uh, C compiler, and he'll convert that down into uh, the machine code. Now before that happens, there's a, a linker process which takes any other library software, like software that is going to use to help you out, and it will, it will link that and bring it in to your program. Then it goes into this loader, it runs it, and then you see the result. So we're going to go through this process over and over and over again where we're typing code, we're compiling it and linking it, this will ha and loading it. This will happen in basically like one phase. And then running it will be the third phase. And you'll see how we program, we compile, we run. We program, we compile, we run. And that's, that's the process of programming. Now to teach you, we're going to use the C programming language. And people ask me oftentimes, why C? And I like to teach C or use that as the basis of computer science and learning programming because if you jump over to Wikipedia, you're going to see a whole bunch of different programming languages that are based on C. So if you jump through here, all of these new programming languages have their roots or their basis in how C has done things. And you go through here and there's, there's lots of them. So to make the list a little bit easier, I, I grabbed a top 10 programming languages that are heavily influenced by C, and here we have Java, we have C, obviously, C Sharp, C++, Objective-C, PHP, Python, Perl, 
JavaScript. So those are probably the 10 most popular. And if you jump over to uh, an Indeed job posting by programming language report, you'll see that the most jobs exist in languages that we just talked about. So PHP was on that list. Uh, iOS, uh, they say here, that's actually um, Objective-C here. They have Perl, C Sharp, C++, JavaScript, Python, and Java. So all of these top languages that there are jobs for are out there that are based on C. And so if you learn C, you'll have a, re a much easier time learning Java or Python or JavaScript, any of these languages that you're going to need for your job. You'll grasp the concepts a lot faster because they're all based on C. So maybe one metaphor and analogy that you can think of this is like learning Latin. If you learn Latin, then it's really beneficial when you go to learn other Latin-based languages because you understand the core of what these other languages are based off of. So in the upcoming lessons, we're going to be focusing on the C programming language, but uh, don't worry if you want to learn JavaScript, you would want to do Python or Java or C Sharp or some other language. Everything you learn here will be applicable in those languages and you'll be a better programmer for going through this experience and really starting with the fundamentals of programming and not just jumping to a high level language right away. So that wraps up lesson one. I'll see you in lesson two.